Mark, uh, Morton, and, and Miff. I see so many uh, familiar faces here. Thank you for inviting me in the past, and it's great to see you again and to be with you again at this conference. <clears throat> Palestinian Media Watch was founded in 1996. 1996 is important because it's two years after <clears throat> the implementation of the Oslo Accords. We wanted to know what was happening in the internal Palestinian world in Arabic. What were they saying? What were the activities? We wanted to know how they were educating their children. Because we believed then, as we believe now, that the education of the children is key. Peace education is key to peace. Uh, even more, even more than, than negotiations at the political level, how countries, how peoples teach their children to accept the other, uh, that's going to determine if we have peace in the next generation. Now, to this end, We've been using Palestinian media really as a window to Palestinian society. If we were naming the organization today, we'd call it really Palestinian Society Watch. Because we're using all these open sources and we're studying things like sports, culture, even crossword puzzles that appear in the official newspaper of the Palestinian Authority. Everything you're going to be seeing today just about is official of the Palestinian Authority because that's what's critical. What is the Palestinian Authority doing for its people in all these frameworks? And what we've learned over this period of time is that there are two different messages. There's the English language message for foreign consumption, for Norwegian consumption, uh, and there's an Arabic language message for their own people and for their children. And what I'm going to give you today is a little window into that Palestinian world, what is happening at the children's level uh, and what is happening at the adult level uh, in the Palestinian Authority. One of the answers... Uh, one of the questions we will try to answer was the opening question on the opening slide, how the PA created teenage terrorists. Today, we are watching, we've had six months of terror, 50% of the terrorists using knives uh, and uh, stabbing people, 50% of them have been under the age of 18, and 10% have been under the age of 15. How, do, how did the Palestinian Authority create teenage terrorists. Now, I'm going to open up with some examples from sports, because you're probably thinking, what could be important about sports? Why? What could we be finding in the sports pages of a newspaper that's significant? And the answer is that just because sports is so innocent, because sports is recreation, sports is entertainment, that's why what we're finding there is so significant. Now, during the period of terror from 2000 to 2005, what they call the Intifada, the Palestinian Authority started naming sporting events after terrorists in order to role model for their children. So, for example, during that period, the Palestinian Authority Ministry of Education had a football tournament for 14-year-old boys. What did they name it? The Abdel Basit Udeh Championship Cup. Who was Abdel Basit Udeh? He was a terrorist who killed, who, who, a suicide bomber. He was a suicide terrorist who did the most lethal attack during the entire Intifada period. He killed 31 people at the Passover Seder when he blew himself up. So the Ministry of Education felt this is the important person to role model, and that's who the tournament was named after. Each team in the tournament was named after a different terrorist. So the entire tournament was revolving around glorifying suicide terror. Now, What's so significant is that as bad as this was during the five-year terror campaign, what they call Intifada, it never stopped afterward. And to this day, to this day, the Palestinian Authority continues to name sporting events after terrorists and to role model for their children. I'm going to give you some examples, not during the whole period, just from the recent months. Just from the recent months, look how many terrorists have been uh, had sports events <coughs> in their name. And this first one that you see here is probably <coughs> the most shocking of all, one of the most shocking we've seen uh, over the whole period of time. The youngest terrorist during this terror campaign was a 13-year-old Palestinian boy named Ahmad Manasra. And Ahmad Manasra stabbed a 13-year-old Israeli boy in the neck, put him in critical condition where he was for over a week, and he almost died. Uh, in the end, he survived. Uh, how did the Palestinian Authority respond to Ahmed bin Nasra, 13-year-old Palestinian who stabbed a 13-year-old and almost murders? Here what we had was an article in the official daily. Many schools from Ramallah and Albira participated in what? The Ahmed Manasra football tournament. 
So already, a month after he stabbed and almost killed an Israeli, they named a tournament for him. Now look at the look at the handing over of the trophy. Look at the ages of the children that we found at this tournament. They're probably around 13 years old also. So if you take this whole message, you have a 13-year-old terrorist who stabs a 13-year-old Israeli in the neck, and what does the Palestinian Authority do? They go to 13-year-olds and say, here, this is your role model. And they do it through sports, which of course is a very powerful, very powerful medium for young children. So this is the Palestinian Authority uh, through schools in the Palestinian Authority. Also, Palestinian Authority School, this is just a few weeks ago, March 29th. What did they sponsor? They sponsored the Dalal Mugrabi Basketball Cup. Dalal Mugrabi. Who was Dalal Mugrabi? Dalal Mugrabi was the female terrorist who, in 1978, led the most lethal attack in Israel's history. It was a bus hijacking. 37 Israelis and one American woman were killed in this terrorist attack. Uh, and look what they do. So two weeks ago, three weeks ago, Palestinian Authority names a basketball tournament. Again, role modeling for these young girls that killing 37 Israelis is something to be admired and something that you have to, someone who you have to look up to. And finally, I want to show you in terms of sports, this is not just happening at the lower levels of the Ministry of Education. It's coming from the very top of the Palestinian Authority. And when I say the very top, the person who is the most senior Palestinian in charge of sports in the Palestinian Authority, his name is Jibril Rajoub. He's a, the head of the Olympic Committee. He's the head of the Football Association. He's the head of the Youth and Sports. Uh, what did he sponsor just a few months ago? He sponsored the Martyr Muhannad Khalabi Table Tennis Tournament. Who was Muhannad Khalabi? He's the terrorist who started this entire terror campaign. He stabbed two Israelis to death in the neck. I'm sorry, not in the neck. He stabbed two Israelis to death who were walking in the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, he also stabbed the wife and two-year-old child of one of them, and they survived. Uh, and that's who Jibril Rajoub decides to name a football tournament after Muhammad, the martyr Muhammad Khalabi, I'm sorry, table tennis tournament. So what we're seeing here is that sports in the Palestinian Authority, and on our website you can find hundreds of examples like this over the years, hundreds. Sports is a message to Palestinian people and to their children especially. If you have killed Israelis, you're a Palestinian hero. Now, something else very important that we learn from sports. Sports has the potential to be a bridge for peace. And in fact, Israel for years. Israel, since the beginning of the Oslo process, uh, Israel has been trying to create sporting events between Palestinian and Israelis, especially Palestinian and Israeli children, uh, in order to build bridges for peace. And the group, the organization that's been leading this has actually been the Paris Center for Peace, because they understand that people-to-people -people contacts are what will build peace. Now, Israel's been promoting this. The Palestinian Authority prohibits this. They call it normalization. Normalization is a dirty word in the Palestinian Authority. You can't have normal relations with Israel. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I want to show you. I want to show you what happened uh, about a year and a half ago when there was a very successful sporting event for youth. I want to show you how the Palestinian Authority responded, and it tells us something very seriously problematic about the Palestinian Authority. Now, this is a sporting event I'm telling you about. When was it? It was right after the Gaza War. Gaza War, if you remember, there were shells falling over the town of Sderot in southern Israel all the time. There was bombing going on in, in Gaza all the time by Israel to counter. So the Paris Center for Peace organized a football tournament. And the article that appeared first in France Press said, Palestinian and Israeli children participate in friendly football matches a few kilometers from the devastated Gaza Strip. Now look at the end of the article. Ofer an 11-year-old from Sterot, a town in southern Israel where many rockets had landed, said, it's great to come back here and enjoy our time after weeks being stuck at home during the war. And a Palestinian 11-year-old said, I love it when we play together like this. I hope that one day there'll be peace between Arabs and Jews and there'll be no more wars and death. You couldn't ask for a more successful sporting event than this. It accomplished just what it was supposed to do. In fact, I would argue that there was more peace built in those few hours of football games than in all the years of negotiations between Israelis and Palestinian leaders. Real peace was built. How did the Palestinian Authority leadership respond when they found out about this tournament? So, the next day we have this article that Palestinian Olympic Committee member 
denounced the match held between Palestinian and Israeli children. He considered it a crime, unpatriotic and immoral. And he called on Jibril Rajub, head of the Football Association, to interrogate the organizers, settle accounts with them, and prosecute them on charges of serious treason. And how does Jibril Rajub respond a few days later? Jibril Rajub said, any activity of normalization in sports with the Zionist enemy is a crime against humanity. Any normalization in sports is a crime. Any, what's, what does normalization mean? Nor, normal is better than peace. United States and Canada have normal relations. They don't need a peace treaty. You with your neighbors here have normal relations. You don't need a peace treaty. Normal is, is better than peace. And what do they say? Any activity of normalization, Jabril Bajou, head of sports, it's a crime against humanity. So what's the message coming to Palestinians just through sports? If you kill an Israeli, you're a hero. And if you make peace with an Israeli, you're a traitor and committing a crime against humanity. So we see that by studying Palestinian society holistically, we're understanding, I would say, the heart and soul of the Palestinian Authority. Which direction are they pulling their people? If the Palestinian Authority was seriously interested in making peace with Israel, would these be the messages they're giving to their children through sports? That if you've made peace, it's a crime against humanity and it's treason? Would these be the messages? Now, what are the Palestinian messages to their people? <clears throat> what are the messages? Now, one of the, probably the most fundamental principle of the entire what was called the peace process, was hoped was a peace process, whether the Palestinian Authority had to recognize Israel in at least the borders that existed or the ceasefire lines that existed before 1967. That was the presumption. And the Palestinian Authority claimed that they did. I want to show you the messages to their own people about the lands that were under Israel uh, before 1967. Now, give you two different categories to see this. This is what I'm showing you here is a picture from the Palestinian Authority Security Forces Facebook page. Early last year, the Palestinian Authority Facebook page of the Security Forces, and this is directly under Mahmoud Abbas's control, they started putting what they called pictures from Palestine. And I want to show you how they define the cities of Israel in these pictures of Palestine. So for example, good evening, occupied Jaffa. Jaffa is part of Tel Aviv. Why are they calling it occupied? Good morning, occupied uh, Caesarea. Good evening, occupied Akka. We've probably had 50 or 60 examples like this of every part of the country also repeating. And the message is that there was, that the occupation started in 1948. Now, why is this significant? Palestinian leaders come to here and they come to your government and they say, we're not against Israel, we're against the occupation but they tell their people that the occupation started in 1948. And okay, this is just one example, and this is as official as you can get coming from, coming from, the, uh, from the Facebook page. We even see this in crossword puzzles that appear in the Palestinian Authority official, official daily newspaper. I'll give you two examples. A port, this is the clue, a port in occupied Palestine. The answer here is Haifa. And even this, a modern city in occupied Palestine, and the solution is Tel Aviv. So everything, everything is said to be an occupation, and I've given you two, and we get dozens of examples like this throughout the Palestinian official statements by official leaders uh, every single week. Uh, it is the message. It is the message. There were two occupations. There's the occupation in 1948 when Israel was created. There's the occupation in 1967. To the world, we pretend we're concerned about 67. To our own people, we're concerned about 48. Now, how do they... How do they teach this to their children? And this is what's critical here. It's not just... Hmm. What they teach their children is that it's not just what happened in the past. It's also going to determine the future. And now we're going to have... I'm not sure the video is going to run. If it doesn't, I'll just read to you what's in the video just so you get a sense. If it... If it runs, that. 
صيانيه لك يا مروان رحت على يافا وشفتها وانبسطت فيها بس اصدقائي بحكي لكم يعني يافا اكيد اكيد مش يافا وبس يافا وحيفا وعكا والناصره وكل المدن الفلسطينيه اللي اللي احتلت في 48 رح ترجع لنا بيوم اصدقائي الاطفال اوكي All the cities occupied in 1948 will return to us and return to us. That's the message. And this, this was on children's program called Children Talk. It's the most important children's program on Palestinian official, official TV. Now, it wasn't only just, just this one time. I'm going to show you how often this happens. A few months later. يعني هي الاراضي الموجوده حاليا موجوده حاليا آه. تحت سيطره الاحتلال للاسف حيفا ويافا وعكا صحيح والناصرة كثير كثير من هاي الاراضي المدن بذكرهم بحلقات قادمه ان شاء الله انا بعتذر يا زلمه انا ما بقصد احرجك بس بقصد انه هاي المعلومات على طول لازم تضلها موجوده طبعا. جواتنا لازم الاحتلال يعرف انه احنا مؤمنين جدا وعلى ثقه انه هاي كلها الارض لنا يعني 48 كلها لنا وراح ترجع لنا صح؟ طبعا Okay, again, the identical message. And then the next month in December 2015, I won't play the whole thing, but she ends up saying all of this land is going to be under the state of Palestine. It's all under the state of Palestine. So the message to Palestinian children, and we see it in the school books as well, and this is official Palestinian TV controlled by the leadership, is that the occupation of Haifa, Jaffa, and Akko are temporary occupation, which will return to us one day. A number of years ago, there was a poll in the Palestinian, done in the Palestinian Authority by Palestinian pollster, and they asked Palestinians if they recognized Israel's right to exist. Palestinians over the age of 50, 50% recognized Israel's right to exist. Palestinians uh, in the youngest age category that was, what was there, age 18 to 25, 8% recognized Israel's right to exist. The fantastic success from the Palestinian Authority's perspective of indoctrination of the young children. The adults who knew Israel, the adults who, who, who knew Israel before the Oslo Accords, before, before the terror, those people recognized Israel's right to exist, at least 50%ed. The younger generation that's brought up just on Palestinian education, less than 10% recognize Israel's right to exist. So this is what we're dealing with with this. Now, you're laughing already. Why is this significant? In order to justify to their people, in order to justify to their people the Palestinian, that, that they deny Israel's right to exist, they tell them that Israel never had a history in the land. Now, one of the most prominent people in history who was in the land of Israel and who was a Judean and a Jew uh, was Jesus. Now, if a Judean Jesus was in the land, then how can they tell their people there never was a Jewish people in the land? So what they do is they turn Jesus into a Palestinian And I want to show you, this is the Mufti, the most important religious figure in the Palestinian Authority, and this is on Palestinian TV. وعاش في هذه الأرض معروف ولد في بيت لحم وهكذا فهو فلسطيني بامتياز نحن نقدر سيدنا عيسى عليه السلام نؤمن به عليه الصلاة والسلام كإيماننا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Okay, so, so not only was Jesus a Palestinian but he also taught Islam he didn't teach Christianity by the way, that is not something that the Palestinians made up that actually exists in the Quran uh, in one of the chapters of the Quran the fifth chapter of the Quran it talks about Um, Muhammad coming to the Jewish people, to the children of Israel, and says to them, I'm not coming to teach you anything new just to correct your mistakes. In the same chapter, it says he then came to the Christians and says, I'm not teaching you anything new, I'm just coming to correct your mistakes. The presumption being that, or the message of this chapter in the Quran, is that the religion that Moses got from God was Islam, and the Jews distorted it. Then, and then, Uh, Allah gave it again. He gave it again to Jesus. It was Islam. And the Christians distorted it. Finally, he gave it to Muhammad, and Muhammad kept it properly. And that's the Islam of today. So that when he's saying here, Jesus was a Muslim and a Palestinian, that's the Muslim part is actually part of classical Islam. The Palestinian, of course, is something totally made up. Uh, the land of Judea was called Judea until 
uh, at least the year 135, uh, when it was named Palestina by the Romans, that when Jesus was living there, he couldn't possibly have been called a Palestinian, he was a Judean. In any case, why is this important? This is important, again, because the Palestinians have to deny Israel's right to exist. They have to. So if, the, if Jews, Jesus was a Judean, then the Jews were there. Then they have a history. Then they have a right to exist. But the Palestinian Authority won't let their people have any any indication. Of, so they deny Jewish history and, at the same time, deny Christian tradition, all for the purpose of denying Israel's right to exist. Now, I want to show you how serious I take this. When the Pope was in Israel two years ago, there were articles, there were many, many articles about the Pope being there. The children, these are children from Bethlehem, from the near ref, refugee camp near Bethlehem. The children gave His Holiness the Pope a food stamp in the name of Jesus since he was the first refugee. Jesus was the first belt. Now look what else they did. They went, they have a museum in Bethlehem. They made a special exhibit just for the Pope. And look what they put in this exhibit. They took famous classical pictures and paintings of Jesus throughout history, like the deposition, which you see over here. And what they did is they cut them all in half. They created paintings in half of them. And the second half was always a picture of a Palestinian. So Jesus is a Palestinian. That's the message. And there's a whole series on our website. You can see all of them. I'm showing you three here. This, again, is a famous picture of Jesus. And here they have a Palestinian. And here also, likewise, here they put the separation security barrier uh, so that Jesus is now talking in front of the security barrier. So it's very, now, what, not only do they deny Israel's right to exist by this, but there is no such thing as an ancient Palestinian history so they do two things. At the one hand, they erase Jewish history from the land. On the other hand, they place themselves in the land 2,000 years ago. And even though there was no such thing as the Palestinian people back then, uh, not really until 1965 with the establishment of the PLO, uh, they give themselves a history. So this is what's being done here. It shows you how hard they work at denying, I'm sorry, denying Israel's right to exist. Now, as bad as denying Israel's national right to exist. I'm going to show you they go even further in literally denying Jewish humanity and denying Jews the right to exist. And I want to show you this likewise um, in their own words. And I'm going to start off. This is a, the same important Palestinian children's program. I want to show you what poem they had this girl say on TV last year. <laughs> Jews, the children of Zion, are the most evil among creations. Barbaric monkeys, the poem then continues, wretched pigs. This is the third child. Third child, we've heard reciting this poem by heart on Palestinian television in recent years. Now I want to show you another example, similar poem, also the same program. <laughs> <laughs> they raped the women in the city squares. Is this girl even old enough to know what she's saying when she said they raped the women in the city squares? And what else did she say? The, the, the pigs, the descendants of pigs, uh, Allah's enemies... I want to show you what, one more, because this one's very important in terms of its frequency. This was on television in November 2015 for the sixth time that we've heard this on Palestinian TV said by children. <laughs> Okay, Zion now is Satan. Now, when I say this, I want to look, you look at the other children who've said this poem. Look at the ages of these children, all of whom knew this poem by heart and all said it on various children's settings. And there was another girl. And then what happened was 
two years ago, they invited the poet, the Egyptian poet who wrote this poem. They had a big event. He read the poem on stage, and then the minister of culture went on the stage and gave the poet an award. So let, let's take the total message that kids are getting. They're getting, first of all, the Jews are subhuman, descendants of monkeys and pigs. Now it's even worse, Satan. Satan is this evil force causing evil in the world. Because of this, they're the enemy of Allah, they're God's enemy, the most evil of all of Allah's creations. How are those children being brought up on these messages ever going to make peace with Israelis? How can they? They'll be going against the most basic instincts to make peace with the enemies of God, who are, who are descendants of animals, who are Satan in the world. That's the messaging coming from, from only official sources. These are all official sources in the Palestinian Authority. I'm going to show you another final example, and this was important. This is February 19th. Just a few months ago, terror is going on. Many, many children, many, many children we know have been involved in terror. And look at what they have. This girl, and this is the fourth child we've heard doing this on Palestinian TV. Uh, listen to what she said. Okay, so here it's going beyond demonization. It's got the demonization at the beginning, and then it goes to war that will sweat, smash the oppression and destroy the Zionist soul. So you've got young children, this terror going on outside, young children are going around, teenagers are going around stabbing people, and then on this children's program, the children are talking about a war, a war to smash the oppression. And like I said, all of these are the other children who said this on official Palestinian TV. So what we're getting is all these hate messages coming from official sources at ages when the children are absolutely too young to have any idea what they're talking about. Too young to know what the enemy of God is. Too young to know what raping women in the city squares is. Too young, and they have no filters. These children are victims. These children are absolutely victims of the hate education because they're being poisoned at an age, at an age where they have no ability, no ability to have any uh, any sense, any sense other than what their people are, are teaching them. Now, I'm going to show you how these messages that we're hearing at the children level are actually part of a whole ideology at the adult level. And the person you're going to hear now, you can hear in a second the two most important religious leaders in the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the first one you're going to hear is the person who Mahmoud Abbas, head of the PA, uh, appointed to be his personal advisor on religion two years ago. He also appointed him to be the head of the Sharia courts, the head of all the Islamic courts in the PA. Very, very important person. Now, this is so critical. The Palestinian leadership tells the world the problem is territory, West Bank, Jerusalem, Gaza Strip. Listen to what they tell their, all, their people. Again, this is at the senior level of the religious authority of the Palestinian Authority. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> is the conflict about territory? doesn't even mention territory. The conflict, he says, is nothing new. Why? Because Islam has been fighting not against Israel, but against Jews. This is pure, pure, unadulterated anti-Semitism, vicious anti-Semitism. Jews are said to be, in his talk, represent falsehood, represent evil, represent devils, represent Satan, and therefore, therefore the conflict is just a continuation of that conflict between good versus evil. Evil today, which had been through history, the Jews today, it's represented by the state of Israel. That's the message coming from the senior Palestinian Authority religious leader, again, close to Abbas. Abbas appointed him. That's his message, that Israel is Satan's project. Now, Will adjusting borders, does it sound like adjusting borders is going to be able to make peace with Satan's project? Of course not. And that's the message coming from the Palestinian leadership to its people. Now, beyond 
beyond not accepting Israel uh, as a state, because of all this demonization, because we're Allah's enemy, the other most important religious figure, this is the Mufti of the Palestinian Authority, <coughs> defined the entire conflict with the PLO since 1965, with Fatah since 1965 until today, as not a fight for land, but as actually a fight for genocide, a fight for the extermination of Jews. This is the Mufti at a Fatah celebration, and the first person you're going to hear speaking is actually the moderator. Notice how he introduces the Mufti. Listen to the words he chooses. So you see, it's not just for children what you heard about monkeys and pigs. Listen to how he defines the Jews. <laughs> The Mufti here is quoting an Islamic tradition attributed to Muhammad, it's called the Hadith. And in this Hadith, it says that the hour of resurrection, the end of time, the redemption of humanity is contingent on the extermination of Jews. And the final Jews are going to hide behind rocks and trees, which will call out, Muslim, servant of Allah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. So the, the battle is not for land. The, the minister, the, the, the head of the Sharia courts, Abbas's advisor, says the battle is against Satan's project. And here he says it's not even against the project. The battle is against individual Jews to bring about their extermination. That's what the Mufti of the Palestinian Authority believes. Now, I want to focus for just a moment on specifically the Ministry of Education. Again, I talk about education being the key to peace. I want to show you messages coming through from the Ministry of Education. And we did an entire report on the Ministry of Education, and you have copies of it. Uh, MIF was gracious enough to translate it into um, into Norwegian, so you have a full copy. I want to show you some of the highlights of this report, and let's think about what, what it means that children are being brought up this way. The first chapter in the report is just names of schools. Now, we include 25, the names of 25 schools only because we stopped after a round number. We could have kept going and searching. We found 25 schools named, named after terrorists, and I want to show you what that means, which terrorists they're choosing. What you see here are 12, the pictures of 12 different children who were all murdered together in a bus hijacking by a terrorist named Dalal Mugrabi. You remember in the beginning we talked about Dalal Mugrabi and the sporting event named after her, the basketball tournament two weeks ago. In any case, she, these children were all killed by her. In addition to the 25 adults who were killed by her, what do we find? The Palestinian Authority named three schools after Dalal Mugrabi. Not just the sporting event you heard about. Three schools are named after this mass murderer. This is the bus that she hijacked together of the terrorists. Uh, these are children in one of the Dalal Mugrabi schools. And what are they wearing on their school uniform? This is the school logo. The school logo has the picture of the terrorist who killed 12 children. So these kids go to school from grade 1 through grade 8 wearing the picture of a terrorist who killed 12 children and 25 adults. That's the message to these kids. Uh, Palestinian Authority likes to go to schools and interview children named in, the, in schools named after terrorists. And I want to show you uh, when they went to, the, to interview girls in the Dalal Mugrabi High School, listen to what the girls said. <laughs> دلال المغربي قائدة عظيمة هذه المناضلة ربما ماتت وصعدت روحها إلى السماء ولكن ما زالت أمهاتنا تنجب ألف دلال وما زالت روحها ثارية فينا دلال المغربي أعطتنا الكثير وأنا شخصيا أفتخر بأنني أنتمي إلى مدرسة دلال المغربي وأمية حياتي أن أصل للدرجة التي توصلت إليها الشهيدة المناضلة Her life's ambition is to reach the level of Dalal Mugrabi who killed 37 Killed 30. That's what these kids, and that's what Palestinian Authority Television wanted to have come across by going to the school and interviewing the teachers and interviewing the children. This was a whole long program uh, 
about the Dalal Mugrabi school. They wanted to give that message that these children are being brought up to see Dalal Mugrabi uh, as a role model. Now, I'm going to show you another school, again, focusing on Ministry of Education. This is a school in Bethlehem. Now, what kind of a picture... What kind of a picture would you put in front of a school? Who would you put there as a role model for the kids? There's a school in Bethlehem, the Palestinian Authority School. There's a picture over here over the front door. You know what it says over here? The heroic, the heroic martyr Ayat al Akhras. Who is Ayat al Akhras? 17 year old girl suicide bomber, the youngest girl suicide bomber. So that's who. The school, and they look at this, these are high school girls, age 17, 18, 16. So that's the person who they see every single time they walk into school as a role model for them. 17-year-old suicide bomber. That's the message coming through. Now, this is also something shocking that we found um, in three Palestinian schools. Now, you might recognize this picture or figure out what this picture is. Remember I just read to you what the Mufti said. The Mufti said, when it comes to the final extermination of Jews... The trees are going to call out, Muslim servant of Allah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Well, that's what it says here. The tree is calling out to this Muslim, Muslim servant of Allah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Look at this Jew, look at this petrified Jew. Uh, and the Muslim's coming to kill him. The final Jews are going to be exterminated. Where do we find this? Three Palestinian Authority schools place this on their Facebook page. Places Again, message is very straightforward. Uh, the Jews have no right to exist. Not only that, redemption is contingent upon killing Jews. If you kill Jews, you're actually doing a service to humanity, is the message, because they're Allah's enemy, they're evil, they're Satan, and if you kill them, you're bringing the world closer to redemption. All of these are the messages that are bringing all of those kids out onto the streets to kill Israelis in these last few months. Now, to go from the formal education, just one series of examples from something that happened just, just now. During this whole terror campaign, Fatah, every year in January, celebrates the anniversary. This year was the 51st anniversary of Fatah. And look what they did. They had a march in Bethlehem. And look how they dressed the kids up. They put masks and black masks on the kids. They had some of the children, it says here in the article, children were seen carrying RPGs, models of RPGs, and models of explosive belts. Literally suicide belts. That's what they decided. Fatah, not Hamas. Everything you've seen is Fatah and the PA, the moderates. They put suicide belts on these kids. You see them marching over here. They have the masks, the same masks that the actual terrorists who are also hiding their faces have. The message to the kids is, you are like us. You are participants in this battle. You could also put a suicide belt on and, and blow up Israelis. That's what Fatah, Fatah's message was to the children just a few months ago in January 2016. Now, um, Morton was talking before about our work that we're doing here with, with members of parliament, with foreign ministry, uh, and we've been working with them for a number of years. Uh, we work with members of parliament around the world and with governments around the world. I want to show you an interview that I had with Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, a press conference that I had with Hillary Clinton when she was still senator before she was secretary of state. But I want you to hear how she describes education for children because what we talked about at this press conference was children, and you'll completely understand what she's saying as soon as you listen to her, and you're going to hear Hebrew now, not Arabic, because this was Israeli TV news. Morning, everyone. <laughs> These textbooks do not give Palestinian children an education, they give them an indoctrination that basically, profoundly, poisons the minds of these children. Okay. profoundly poisons, and that's what I wanted to hear. They don't give them an education, it's indoctrination, and it's being poisoned. And that's what I said before, and I agree completely here with Hillary Clinton. These children are victims. Someone who's poisoned is a victim. These children have literally... Uh, in a sense, not even free choice, getting these messages indoctrinated at such a young age till they reach the point where they're 12 and 13 and 14 and 15, and you almost can't blame them. Not almost. You can't really blame them for taking a knife and running out and killing an Israeli, because if you can imagine this world of hate and, and heroism 
the hate and the heroism, the hate of the Jew and the heroism they can achieve and what God wants of them, put that all together into the mind of a 13-year-old who wants to be famous, wants people to know him. How can you blame the 13 Well, you can't. But you can blame the Palestinian Authority leadership. You can blame the Palestinian Authority educators because they are totally responsible for this poisoning of the Palestinian Authority uh, youth. Now, the final thing that I want to talk about now is this particular terror campaign. And here, because it's so critical... Um, I want to tell you what I told the members of the foreign ministry today that we spoke to, that I think uh, Norway, the EU countries, even the United States, have a fair degree of responsibility for the terror that was going on for all these months because of their lack of response. And I'm not saying it that I think so. I want to show you how one of the Palestinian leaders uh, has said something that makes me think so. Now, how did this terror campaign start? So it started first with the Palestinian Authority telling its people that Israel was planning to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, we've heard this for years. All of a sudden, in August and September, we heard this over 50 times, either destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque, defile the Al-Aqsa Mosque, a tremendous, you know, if you're looking at a, at, a, at a graph, all of a sudden, there's this tremendous rise in the number of accusations. This is even a government decision. Palestinian Authority government decision talked about uh, Israel's intention of taking control of the mosque destroying it and establishing the alleged temple uh, on its ruins. By the way, why do they refer to it as alleged temple? Because there never could have been a temple because the Jews never were in Israel. Therefore, every time they talk about the temple, they call it an alleged temple, ignoring all the endless archaeological finds and everything. In any case, it's the alleged temple. The point here, Israel's planning to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, here's one of the messages. This is a Fatah uh, Facebook page, official Facebook page. Here you see Israel is like ISIS, destroying the mosque. Uh, we reach, it was such a repeated message that we end up with 50% of Palestinians believing that Israel intends to destroy the mosque and replace it with a Jewish temple. This was a Palestinian poll. So this is a very successful hate campaign by the Palestinian Authority leadership from all of its leaders. Uh, Israel's planning to destroy your holiest place. That's what they told Palestinians. And then what happens is Mahmoud Abbas, head of the PA, gets on television and he tells Palestinians in the middle of September that we won't allow the Jews with their filthy feet to defile our Al-Aqsa Mosque. And then he talks about violence. We bless every drop of blood spilled for Jerusalem, blood that has been spilled for Allah. Every martyr will reach heaven. Everyone wounded will be rewarded by Allah. Literally talking here about getting involved in violence for, for Al-Aqsa. And then what happens is the violence starts and then the Palestinian Authority and Fatah message becomes even more, more intense and more clear, more clear in terms of promoting terror. Listen to this official Fatah television, Auda TV. <laughs> Think of the different words that you hear in music videos. Hear what would the words kill them as you wish, drown them in a sea of blood. That's the messages in music videos that we get. Palestinian TV. Then Fatah's Facebook page started glorifying the use of the knife. And here we see, uh, I'll show you some of these examples. We've had dozens and dozens of these examples. The knife, they started calling it the knife intifada. Uh, it was something that everybody could do. That's why they were promoting it. You didn't need a gun. Everybody could buy a kitchen knife or take one from their kitchen and go out. And this is what Fatah uh, was promoting. Now, this terror campaign tragically succeeded very, very well. There were sometimes three, four, even five terror attacks in the same day. Most of them didn't succeed. Far too many succeeded. Over 30 people, I think 34 people have been killed. Um, and in addition to this passive glorification of terror through pictures of knives, I want to show you uh, two statements by Jibril Rajoub here. Now, Jibril Rajoub, again, remember, is I mentioned earlier, he's the head of sports. He's the one who's been glorifying terror, the terrorists. But he's also the Deputy Secretary of the Fatah Central Committee. Fatah Central Committee is their governing body. It's headed by Mahmoud Abbas. Very senior, senior Palestinian official. Listen to what he said on Palestinian television. <laughs> انه المناضل 
والاسير والشهيد هو ملك لكل الشعب الفلسطيني. المجتمع الدولي ما بيقبلش انه باص يتفجر في تل ابيب. بس المجتمع الدولي مش عم بيسال انه في مستوطن او جندي موجود في الاراضي المحتله في المكان الغلط في الزمان الغلط شو بصير معه؟ ما حدا سال عنه. ما حدا سال عنه، من هون احنا ما بدنا كمان نناضل بمفهوم انه العالم يبقى معنا. Okay, a number of very important things were said here by Jibril Ajib. One, first of all, the people who are killing Israelis, these are individual acts of bravery. He says, I congratulate everyone who carried them out. Explicit support for murder. I congratulate everyone who carried them out. But then, the more important line, when I'm in Norway and a few weeks ago when I was in Sweden, before that in Belgium at the European Parliament, what is he saying? The international community does not agree to a bus exploding in Tel Aviv, but the international community does not care what happens to a settler or a soldier in the occupied territories in the wrong time, in the wrong place. We must fight in a way that the world and the international community remain by our side. What is he saying? He's saying two things important. One, the Palestinian Authority knows that they have to listen to the demands of the international community. Third of the Palestinian budget comes from the international community. They can't do anything that will get the international community upset. And therefore, he says, we can't blow up buses in Tel Aviv because that they won't accept. We'll get into trouble. We have to fight, he says, in a way that the world will remain on our side. And what is that? Kill individuals who happen to be in the wrong place and at the wrong time. In other words, the silence of the international community during the early months of this terror campaign, and literally continuing until today, the deafening silence, the, the creation of a symmetry. We're against violence on both sides that we've heard from a lot of European government leaders. Uh, that has been a message that the Palestinian Authority has understood. They don't care. They don't care about individuals killed in the wrong place at the wrong time. Therefore, we can keep killing them. Therefore, I congratulate you. Therefore, uh, it's heroic. These are the messages coming from the Palestinian Authority. And that's what I told them today in the foreign ministry. You're silent. I said something. I, I, I said, there's no doubt that you're not in favor of the killing of civilians anywhere. You're not in favor of this. However, that's the message that the Palestinian Authority has received from you. And if you want to do something to really, really stop this terror campaign, what I said to them today, is you have to make a very public statement. You have to condemn openly Jibril Rajoub for saying that he congratulates the terrorists. You have to condemn Fatah for congratulating the terrorists and supporting the terror. You can't create this equality. You can't create the symmetry because the Palestinian Authority is interpreting it as a green light to murder. The Palestinian Authority is interpreting it literally as a green light to murder. Now, it's our hope by bringing this material to the governments here, and I mentioned I was recently in Sweden, twice this year already in Sweden, in Europe, and in Britain, and British Parliament this year, we are putting together, we're putting together pockets of uh, between you know, 5, 10 to in some parliaments already 20, 30, 40, 50 members of parliaments who are familiar with this now, who understand what's really going on, who are now beginning to work uh, and to fight for Israel. And it's our hope, it's our hope that we will generate enough support against Palestinian hate education, that the European community, the United States, will finally use the, the financial weapon as a, as a lever, as a, as a force to demand the end of hate education and the beginning of peace education in the Palestinian Authority, so that hopefully we will see the Palestinians raise a generation of, of children, not on this hatred, but on peace messages, so that at some future time, we can have peace with the Palestinian population. Thank you.